Hi there everybody, I'm Hal Weeks coming to you from Daigle Auto Harps. Been a while since I made a video here. Um, this video is uh, going to be a process video. I'm going to show you a fixer upper and all the steps that it's going to take. Um, and I'm just using my smartphone for this video. I'm going to take a lot of different, um, uh, it's going to require a lot of different steps. I'm going to show you every step that I can and do some voiceover and uh, just give you uh, sort of a look at all the different steps that it takes to restore or upgrade this particular harp. So let's meet our patient, shall we? Okay, so this is a 1984 Japanese-made Centurion model, B model, Oscar Schmidt. And it's got several different things that need to be fixed on it. Um, first of all, the pins are a little loose. And so I'm going to tighten up the pins and I'm going to show you how I do that. Um, the anchor is not coming out, but I'm going to do the anchor job anyway to secure it, tie it down so that it doesn't ever come out and it stays nice and solid uh, then I'm going to restring it in uh, probably a DG diatonic way and I'm going to replace the cord bars and put on this has a custom set of cherry daigle bars but there are several things wrong with it these are old style bars uh, we don't build them like this anymore and um, um, so I'm going to be replacing the combs and putting on a brand new set of maple bars. And um, I'm going to do that. There's also, there's a tiny little crack here in the top. This is a Centurion model and a Centurion has a solid top. And in this case, probably the, the heat or the humidity got to it and it has a little crack. So I'm going to go in underneath here and I'm going to put a spline underneath here. I've got a lot of splining to do. And um, um, the new cord bars. And I'm going to share all of those different steps with you as well as the restring. This is an interesting harp because the back, this is back when they put ash backs on them. This pretty ash back. And it's signed by Brian Bowers. In this case, part of his last name is wearing off, uh, but that's Brian's signature right there. Uh, so it's an autograph model, um, and uh, it's not an American-made one, but it's probably in the first few years when they were making them in Japan, and these still sound good. You would not want to do all of this modification um, with custom cord bars on one of the new Oscar Schmitz because they just don't sound good and they're not worth doing all of that um, high-end uh, upgrading. But these old ones, they don't make them like this anymore, folks, and they are worth, especially when they're set up as a diatonic auto harp, this one is, um, and uh, they are worth doing that if you want putting on nicer cord bars and so we're gonna we're gonna keep this one with real nice daigle cord bars but we're gonna upgrade the set and make it a better set and uh, that'll fix some of the problems that are going on with this older set that is um, uh, this auto harp has seen a lot of play I can tell because of the way the pins are loose and so I'm gonna tighten up those pins and we're going to get to that right now. So, um, <clears throat> I'm doing this recording on the fly as I watch the video with you. And here we have... Let's see, what am I going to do first? That's right, I'm going to take the cord bars off. And I've already edited this video and taken out all the extraneous material that I thought was too much. And 
got it down to be about a 40 minute video and it's only half of the process these are old style daigle cord bars from about 20 years ago when they used to make them completely different than what our standard is today and old left-handed Hal is um, realizing that he should have made put the camera to the right but um, it is what it is this is the video I got and um, we're gonna have to make do with some of my left-handed blocking of some of the shots <clears throat> These cord bars are pretty messed up. There's one that doesn't match. There's one missing. The tops are coming off. I'll show you. Um, I think I hold one up to the camera here so that you can see it. Yep. the the wood veneer is a lot thicker on the old ones than the new ones and i guess it was a problem i'm not uh party to why they changed the cord bar style but they don't make them like this anymore and the new set will be up to the modern standard and as you will see in a minute these old style combs they they make the combs different too there is this mylar flap system that they use instead of springs and the old style they were just glued on to the cord bar and as you can see that glue is coming undone and they don't make them like this anymore either these combs are now totally different and they have an aluminum strip on the front that holds all this in place and it's better and the new system you will see um, in the next installment of this video the new system will be installed and you'll see the new setup which has the aluminum strap right now I'm just removing the old we got to get everything off the face of this auto harp so that I can access the sound hole to repair the crack that's in it. This is a pickup which is attached to the top through an audio wire that goes through here. You can plug in to the side of the harp like that. And so this will have to stay in place while I do my surgery. Next, we're going to remove all of the pins and the strings. And I'm doing it the way here, showing you how you would do it with a tuning wrench, which is very slow, but it's not that bad, especially if you have one that's L shaped like mine is. There's old left handed Hal getting in the way again. Each pin has to come off completely. You don't do this when you're changing strings, but these pins need to be tightened to make them good for the next decade of use. And so I'm going to take them all out, taking the strings off at the same time. And in a minute, I'm going to be showing you how we, how the pros do it, which is using a drill to remove the pins instead of a tuning wrench, which is just so slow. But I'm going to get them all off of there. First, I'm going to show you what we do with the strings. These are all the old strings that came off the instrument. And if you'll walk with me, 
you will see our string repository, which is just a box, but look at that. We've been collecting these for a couple of years now. And we found out that we can recycle strings through elderly instruments. We have to get 15 pounds of strings saved up, and then we can recycle them. So this is how the pros do it. I, we took a tuning wrench, and we took off the shaft and turned it into a drill bit. We had to file off sides of it to make them flat so the drill chuck would hold on to it. But this is what we use. Goes right into the drill. You have to make sure that it's straight. That's not. So I think I redo it here to get it straight. Now it's straight enough. Set it for Lefty Lucy. I don't put them in this way because it can go too fast and they can go too deep in and they have to go to ex an exact height. And so I put them all in manually. But this is a much faster way to remove them there they are all removed. <coughs> and I'm going to show you how we fix the holes. And I'm also going to tell you about a couple of other ones. This is going to have to be repaired as well. We'll get to that in a little bit. There's the label. It does not say made in the USA, but it has that little star on it, that little um, five star down there. And that is... Um, indicative of a Japanese made instrument, I believe. I'm gonna take the anchor out and show you the solid top. Can't see it at the sound hole. You can also see the tan lines, the how much the top has patinaed and oxidized over the top over the years. But you can see the grain going straight through. There's no plywood there. And so that top is solid. Okay, we use super glue, medium or thin density. Do not use gel or gap filling super glue for doing this. And for years we didn't use this method and uh, somebody recommended it to us. And we tried it and it actually works pretty well. But it doesn't work for all things. If they're really loose, we use another system. I'm using a tiny little dowel rod. It's bigger than a toothpick, but it holds more glue. And what you do is you put it in the holes and run it around the edges so that you're coating the walls of each hole. And then of course you have to let it dry. The other ways to do it are with a curl of sandpaper. You make a little tube out of sandpaper and have the sand facing out. You drop it down in the hole and then you drive the pin back into the center of the little sandpaper tube and that shims it very effectively. So now time has gone by and the glue has dried takes about two hours before I try to put uh, new pins in. You could do it overnight. In this case, I forgot my hammer, so I had to go get my hammer. And I tap a couple of times just to tap it into place. And then I use a T-styled tuning wrench, not the L-style. That way I can push down directly on top of it to drive it down in and it's it's uh, tighter than it was which is the object and some of these pins in the video look like they were really tight but they're not um, the pressure is coming from driving straight down on it because I'm making new holes 
now I'm measuring the height of the pin because I have to drive it in to an exact height on my height gauge, which is this little white stri strip of plastic with a black line. And I'm going to show you that in a minute, so hang on. Seven eighths of an inch is the height that you want the tuning pin set at so that when you put three turns on the string, it's at the correct height for the bridges. So all of that has to be preset. When you remove strings, you turn them back out two and a half, three turns, and leave them at that height, and they will be good. But if they're uneven, seven eighths is a good height for the top of the tuning pin to be off the top of the harp. And this is a very long process to get them all set at the right height. And I found one that's too loose. After I got them all in, I found one that's too loose, so I'm taking it out again. And I'm going to put more glue into that hole. Usually there's one or two that aren't quite there, so you got to re-line that particular hole. So I'm setting it all up again. I just have a little, that's a um, string wrapper envelope. I just put a little daub of the glue on there. When I get my dowel out, I roll the dowel. You can't see it because of left hand how here. But I roll the dowel in the glue and then coat the outside of it. And now that's got to dry. I can't put the uh, um, pin back into it until it's for a couple of hours. So I'm finishing the process there. I hadn't dri uh, driven all of the pins in yet. So now I'm going to fix this thing. And the crack cannot be um, closed, but it can be splined with a scrap of wood on the bottom. You have to use the same wood if it's on the top, in this case spruce. And we have a lot of that lying around the shop. So I make a, an appropriate, it's about this, as thick as a popsicle stick excuse me, popsicle stick. Popsicle stick wouldn't work though because it's not spruce. The wood has oh, yes. to um, be able to shrink and expand at the same rate as the top. So it's gotta be the same wood. I learned all of this from Pete and Greg and John. I learned so much working here. So a little wood glue. I'm going to hold it in place with my finger until it stays, and then I'm going to clamp it. And it's going across at 90 degrees to the crack underneath. And I'm going to put a little pad on the top so that when I clamp it, I'm not marring the top. Now it's staying in place upside down on the underside of the top. I'm going to use these little uh, rubber clamps that you just squeeze a few times and it uh, squeezes down on the spline under the top. And that's going to have to sit while I go to lunch. And then after lunch and after I teach a lesson in the afternoon, this will be ready to undo. This will not close the crack, but it will keep it from expanding anymore. So there's that. The glue in the hole is, the spline is dried now. Had my lunch. Spline is dried, and now I have to put the uh, 
pin in the hole because that was drying too. And then we're going to do the anchor. In order to do the anchor, we have to close up the sound hole, which is another reason why I did the spline first. I have to close up the sound hole because the whole harp is going to get covered with sawdust. And when I was first doing this, I kept forgetting to cover the sound hole. And then it was a pain to get the sawdust out. So by covering the sound hole, no sawdust gets inside. And I'm smart enough to remember that now. After having done it the wrong way a bunch of times. And then I remember, oh yeah, got to put that pin in. Left-handed Hal, we can't see what he's doing. Oh, I put tape along the bottom. That's part of the anchor process. The tape's down there at the very bottom of the harp, not on the anchor that I'm showing you. But that will protect and also keep me from, um, I'm going to route out the bottom down there in a minute. So I'm doing the pin now, kind of got things out of order. Going to put that pin back in and you've already seen that so you don't have to see that first i have to mark where i'm going to make my cuts for the anchor job there is another video that i made about a couple of years ago that shows this process but I've done it a bunch of times since, and I've changed what I do. There are going to be five screws installed. have to avoid this hole, so I have to put a uh, mark to one side of it. But one goes there, and it's got to go at the very end, but it's got to go in between the slots where the strings go. That's important. And the middle one has to miss that screw so I put it to the right or the left and then we put one in about halfway in between again it's got to be between where the strings go which is why I put the anchor back in now I take it to the sanding table you won't have a sanding table probably unless you have a wood shop the sanding table has those big holes in it and the feet of the harp drop into the holes and keep it from moving. I'm going to show you the bit now that I use. This bit in the other video I have a note as to what the number of the bit is and I will go get that and I will put it in the notes to this video so that you have it. And I've, I understand that it is still available. You can see my five marks there where I'm going to be routing out with the Dremel tool. I've got the bit in the Dremel. I hold it with both hands. I'm doing it left-handed now. Um, you would be probably doing this right-handed if you were a righty. When you do this, always scoop from right to left. As you see me doing there, and I, I pointed it out with my finger. Always move right to left, never left to right. So that the direction of rotation doesn't take over from you and um, try to uh, run away with the, the uh, Dremel tool. This way you maintain control. I'm scooping out where I made the marks. And I have to scoop back about seven eighths of an inch or an inch, which is why I put the, the green tape on the bottom. As long as I don't go back as far as the tape goes or, you know, cross the tape line, 
then I'm good. Down at the bottom of the harp, this here it is wider, and you don't get anywhere near that line. At the top end of the harp, the, the treble end, you get pretty close to the line. So on this end of the harp, the tape isn't even really necessary. And I chose to leave in the entire video here that shows me doing all five scoops so that you understand how deep I'm going and how long it takes to do this job. I've gotten a lot better at it because I've done it about 50 times now. I didn't want to speed this. I could have sped the video up here. I didn't want to do that because I wanted you to see how methodic, methodical and carefully I'm doing this. Because it can be, I had the, uh, the bit flying off once, like a bullet. Um, you have to keep a firm grip on the drum. On the drum. And go slow, always right to left with the scoops. If you stop in one area too long, um, you will burn the wood, which isn't a great tragedy. All this is going to be covered up. But I seem to be doing it these days without burning the wood at all. Um, but when I was first learning to do it, I burned the wood quite a bit. As you can see, I'm getting a lot closer to the tape line. Now here's hole five. And when I finished the job, and you'll see me finish the job, um, I kind of thought that I maybe could have taken a little bit more out because it was a little bit hard to achieve the angle that I needed to get with the drill, but I did manage to do it, so I took just enough. So there it is. The Dremel has a, um, a ventilation system built into it with a little fan, and I can use that fan to kind of blow off the dust, which just gets scooped right into the sanding table because it's got an internal fan that the holes are for. Uh, again, you probably won't have that. And that's why I taped the sound hole closed. So now we're back to my workbench. And uh, I have a little kit that has two drill bits and a little protective cover that I made out of a chrome string anchor. I'll show you that in a minute. And here I attempt to use the right-handed um, calipers to show you the diameter of the drill bit that I'm going to use because I have forgotten what they are up to this point because I use them so often to keep them together. This is a 332 and you can't see that. It wouldn't focus for me. So I wrote it right there. It's a 332 drill bit. Here is the protective cover that I made. And I had to use, um, you could use anything, um, but you've got to protect this edge of the harp from the drill chuck when you are drilling at that angle and I have marred a few so now I put the guard on and that doesn't happen and I tape it on and when I taped this time I didn't do it well enough and you'll see me have to redo that in a minute so I taped that there for doing those two things and then I move it
And then it occurs to me to show you the anchor cover. This is the chrome anchor cover that I removed. And this is what I made my little protective cover out of. This part of it, I used a tin snip. And I had an old rusted out um, chrome cover, which I could cut up. And so I cut it up and I used that part right there to make my cover with. You don't need to do this. You do need to protect the edge with a piece of cardboard or um, something to protect this edge, but you don't have to use something as permanent as I've made for my little kit. I do this job several times a month, so um, I've set myself up with um, a protective cover. So I'm going to drill in at an angle at each of these points with my 332nd drill bit. This is the change that I made from the last video. In the last video, I used the fat bit first and then the thin bit. Now I use the thin bit and I'm drilling the pilot hole into the wood by going through the anchor and into the wood. And that leaves a 332nd pilot hole from the screw behind the anchor. So I go all the way through the anchor. And by having a nice fast drill, it goes really quick. And I have to lean on it. Notice that the auto harp is leaning against a block of wood up at the top. That way I can push against it. And it takes up the, uh, the force of my leaning against the drill and the harp. It helps me push it through the aluminum. Aluminum is really soft, so it's pretty easy to go through it. But as soon as I feel the wood, I stop, but I can't really push the drill bit far enough to have it come out the back of the harp. I've never come out the back of the harp. I used to be real worried that that was going to happen, but um, this way that I do it, got a close up here, and I'm aiming the drill bit between the slots in the anchor and trying to hold it there while I lean on it because the turning bit is going to try to make the drill bit walk to the left or to the right can't remember which. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's got to be aimed between the slots so that the screw is between the slots so that the ball of the string has a little place to rest that it's not resting against a screw. It's not a huge problem if that doesn't happen. Um, I've had them be in the wrong place sometimes and the string still goes in it's just easier if not now i've got a problem because i've got a uh, um, strap button down there that was in the way of my little guard and so i had to flip it up and use it this way which actually is works pretty well so i had never had to do that before usually there's not a string anchor in that spot And you can see how my protector works there. Any damage that is done underneath the chrome cover is hidden when the cover goes on. And you can see by the tan lines where that cover goes. So now we've got the pilot holes drilled and you can see them, tiny little pilot holes, and they line up exactly with the thin little holes that are in the cover, which are too thin for our screws. So we've got to go make those bigger now. That's what the other drill bit is for. We're going to take the 3 8 inch out and we're going to put the 1 8 inch in. I forgot to measure on the caliper, but or I forgot to film it, but it's a 1 8 inch drill bit. And that makes it big enough for the screws we're going to use. And we're going to drill through those 
3.30 seconds into a block of wood. This is just a scrap of wood. And I put the anchor around the edge of the wood and drill through, making the holes larger. To hold it, I put it in a vise. I'm going to show you that now. Here's the vise in our metal shop. And I put the lip down, and then I clamp it onto the lip. To hold the block of wood and the anchor in place, When you put the drill bit through, make sure that it doesn't touch the anchor underneath. Down there, you want to try to avoid scarring the edge of the anchor. What can happen is you can accidentally close up one of the slots and then you can't get the string through to hold the string in place. If that happens, I have managed always to get it back open again. I've used various things. Um, a thin box cutter blade. Just depends on the uh, uh, how much flash you've got going through. So there are the larger holes that we drilled. Right there, they're now big enough for the screws. Notice that they're exactly in the corner of the bend. And on the back, there's flash, and that flash has to be taken off. With a, you can use a file, a memory board, sandpaper. Oh, look, it's Greg, who's just made walnut cord bars, beautiful new walnut cord bars, 15 bar set for a diatonic auto harp. And those are real beauties. The wood veneer is thinner than the old style. And these are going to go on the new harp. Here's the screws that we're going to put through the anchor. Number eight, five eighth inch wood screws. Number eight screws. I don't really understand the numbering of screws, but that's what I understand is the... Um, I don't know why it's a number eight, but it's a number eight. Number eight wood screws. We use five of them. And they're real easy to put in now that this job is done. I use a manual screwdriver, which is not necessarily required, but I have a little bit more control. And I don't damage the top with a manual screwdriver. I'm waxing the screws. So they're lubricated when they go in. I've already got pilot holes, but this is a good idea. You can use wax, you can use soft soap, um, you can use bar soap, um, anything that's going to lubricate that screw a little bit so that it goes into the wood a little easier. And it really does go in pretty well. But because it's a 3.30 second pilot hole, it goes in nice and tight. And when this goes in place, those big holes in the anchor line up perfectly with the little holes in the wood that are underneath. Hold it in place with my nail, pit it under there, wiggle it around till it pops into the hole, and then I lean on the screwdriver. While the screw goes in. This shows you all the steps that are involved in this um, anchor job that when it's done, you won't even see it. But that's why we have to charge what we charge to do the work. It takes 
takes time to do this. I've gotten a lot faster at it. But this is only one step in a multi-step process of um, reclaiming and upgrading this harp. And I wanted you to see this because if you buy a B-model Oscar Schmidt like this, it probably won't have this done and will need to have it done because they are coming out as I show in my other video they're working their way out and destroying the tops this is a problem that's showing up now 50 years later and uh, we want to nip it in the bud because some of these harps are really nice and we want you to be able to play them well into the future this harp did not have damage occurring yet, but by doing it now as preventive surgery, it won't happen in the future. And we have nice new tight pins again. So there it is, voila. That is... Uh, a well anchored harp. I'm going to show you the screws down in there now. There's the screws holding that anchor in place. And it's nice and tight. It's not going anywhere. And it's ready to be strung now, which is what I'm going to do next, which raises some issues about the string schedule and what we're going to use to turn it into a new diatonic harp and as you can see the cover hides it all you would never know it was there so there it is folks it's ready the pins are all done they're nice and tight it's ready to be cleaned up we did the spline on the bottom we did the anchor I took the cover off again because I'm going to need to string it. And we're going to clean up the top and uh, um, get all the, the grime and, and dirt off of it so that it's nice when it's done. So there you have it. That is the first part of this auto harp um, reformation refurbishment video. Um, I'm going to also cut out that section where I'm doing the anchor repair and post that separately. So uh, when you see that come up, know that you've already watched it. Um, but people sort of need to see that process. And since I've refined the process, this newest video sort of outdates the old one by a little bit. So I want it up separately. The second half of the video is forthcoming, um, but it's been about a week or two since I did the first half of the repair. And because it's a, an instrument for our own stock at the shop, there's no hurry to finish it. And so um, I think it's gonna be another week or so before I finish the repair. And uh, when I do, I will be filming all the steps, just like I did in this one, and putting that together so you can see how it comes out. So I'm Hal Weeks. Thank you to my patrons over at Patreon. If you want to be a patron, you can sign up over at patreon.com slash halweeks. Kick in a few bucks a month, and that would greatly satisfy me and encourage me and help me to keep going and making these videos for you. If you're interested in private lessons, I teach lessons through Zoom right from the, the Daigle shop. And you can also contact me through my website, howweeks.com, about your interest in that. So I'll see you next time. I'm Hal Weeks. Bye-bye.